Hello and welcome to this episode of the Her Success Podcast, the podcast that interviews highly successful and accomplished females within the engineering and tech world with the hope of inspiring the next generation of leaders in this space. Her Success is brought to you by Engtal. Engtal is an engineering and technology recruitment company that truly cares about diversity, equity and inclusion. If you're an engineer looking for your next position, or you're a company that wants to partner with a recruitment firm that truly cares about diversity, please get in touch. In this episode, we interview Jen Monkowicz. Jen is the global head of people and culture at Big Tin Cam. They are a 350 person company, headquartered in Massachusetts, but with offices in Sydney, as well as a few other locations across the world. In this episode, we dive into Jen's background and we explore how you can build a close-knit team culture, even when you're managing people from different backgrounds and living in different continents. She talks to us about sales enablement and what inspired her to join Big Tin Can. It's a fantastic episode with a lot of great content. I hope you guys enjoy. Now, let's get to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Her Success Podcast. And today I am incredibly excited um, to be joined by Jen Monkowitz. Um, Jen um, is currently the Global Head of People and Culture at Big Tin Can. Um, They are a sales enablement and customer success um, platform. Um, She's been there for just under a year. And prior to that, she's held various senior HR, culture and people related positions at a number of different organizations, has a fantastic background, and I'm super excited to chat with her today. So Jen, thanks for for coming on and uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Chris, so much for having me here. It's an honor. I've had some great conversations with some folks on your team prior to this, and I'm looking forward to diving right in. Excellent. Well, yeah, so are we. First things first, I know right now you're the global head of people and culture at Big Tin Can, cool yeah. name of, of a company and doing some research over the last week or so. It looks like a great organization to work for. So I'm excited to dive into to that company. Can you start by just giving us a bit of an overview of your background, kind of where you've come from and your journey leading up to today? Yes, absolutely. I'll give you the high level overview, obviously, because I have many years of experience at this point. I started out in the human resources function, actually in staffing. I was in staffing, corporate HR for a brief period of time, but then moved to staffing for about 13 years, where I started off in recruitment for various industries. So we were based out of upstate New York. And I went from a recruiter to then a senior level manager to then running the entire operations for a branch location out of Urban, Massachusetts. Extremely cool exposure. I was on site at various clients as their one and only staffing resource. It was just basically, it, it. what it did was it gave me the opportunity to become extremely resilient. I think staffing's a tough nut to crack. I think being in, a, in the staffing industry, it's very difficult to break into organizations and gain that trust as, as one might know. And I think that it was challenging, but rewarding at the same time. And it also, I think, coming from the staffing industry, what I learned over the years is just basically almost like the always the customer is always right. And even if the customer is not always right, finding a solution to make certain that the customer is satisfied. So that's something that's sort of instilled in me. And, and a pre- pretty quick immediate response is something that I pride myself in as well. Um, the last thing I want to be known as is a, a unresponsive HR department. So those are some of the th- takeaways I have from staffing. But right around um, at that 13-year mark, I decided to explore corporate human resources. I thought that there were many areas of humans that I wanted to explore human resources. So I started to apply to companies that were like HR department one, where I would basically, and most of them were very small under like 50 people. And I worked in a couple of different industries. I started in marketing and advertising and an e-commerce marketing company. And I was their HR department of one, their first person that they had on board. Super cool experience, did everything from recruitment to administration, to strategic planning. And it just, it, I think it set me up for, it gave me quite a bit of experience From there, I moved on to, again, marketing. I was working for a major marketing agency out of Harvard Square in Cambridge. 
super cool experience. I joined that company. I worked, reported directly into the CEO who is still a friend of mine to this day. Like I said, smaller company, HR department of one, subject matter expert. But the cool thing about those small startups is you got to know each and every one of your employees and managers and the best way to service them in the sense and be empathetic, the ability to listen and let people be heard was something that's something that I feel like I started to master. From there, unfortunately, we were an advertising agency that lost one of our clients. It was 50% of our revenue. So I was then forced to kind of look again. A friend of a friend was working in HR at a telecommunications company, Parallel Wireless up in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. Again, a startup type environment. When I started with the company, I interviewed and joined as their global manager of talent. And when I joined that company, we were only 120 employees. And when I did leave there, we were just under 1,000 employees. So I saw significant growth over a short period of time. I also had the exciting opportunity to build out an entire talent acquisition, global talent acquisition team. I had locations in Israel, in India, in the UK. And it really, what I found most exciting and interesting is learning different cultures and how to interact with different individuals within different cultures and kind of understanding like that everyone oper operates just a little bit differently, but we all had that same common goal. So mm -hmm. I, I had a team of 11 at that point. And then from there, I was contacted, uh, I was kind of contacted to come out of uh, Parallel to work at, I worked, I had sort of an interesting year after COVID. I worked at uh, a cybersecurity company briefly. I, then I worked for a, a CRM that was based out of the Ukraine. And then finally landed and started in August or so of last year, speaking with David Keene, the CEO of Big Ten Can. And immediately speaking to David, I felt this instant connection. And I think what attracted me to want to work for this organization and for David, number one, it was, again, a startup feel. I loved that David was the CEO and founder because he was fully invested in the organization. I also thought it, what attracted me and what wanted, made me want to join this team was his, his positivity, his energy, and his passion for the company and for what he does and his people was Honestly, it was intoxicating. It was, it was really, really quite refreshing. And I was just like, I was I, in my heart of all hearts. I'm like, I feel like this is meant to be in between. I did also do some consulting, which I think is kind of cool. And it, it's something I may fall back on later in, in my career as I kind of close it out, getting, you know, several years from now, getting close to retirement. But right now I'm loving big tin can. I love the people. And that's sort of where I'm at. I, I don't plan on going anywhere soon. I'm hoping that I can stay here for a significant amount of time. Love it. Yeah, no, I, as I said, I was doing a bit of research on Big Tin Can before we jumped on with the podcast. I had a little bit of a look into them yesterday and they certainly seem like a, some company. Could you give us a bit of an overview of them? Like what, what is their product? And just kind of high level overview of the company. Sure, absolutely. So as you mentioned earlier on our call or on our chat that um, Big Tin Can is a sales enablement platform. And basically what this platform is designed to do, it's designed to empower sales reps, managers and marketing as well to, to provide customers, um, customers with a better experience, but also to dr drive sales success. And ultimately, this platform allows access to several products within our platform suite of products, several training opportunities to ultimately make better business decisions and close sales deals faster than they normally would. So uh, one of the things that I found interesting uh, when I looked into the company uh, was your values. Like I've interviewed a lot of people and spoken about various values and your right. ones which stood out as quite unique and you know i think it was unorthodox maverick and pioneering and which which i really liked how do you see them manifest themselves in the kind of culture of the company that's a great question and i think in terms of unorthodox i think that and another reason why i truly love tech in a startup environment is that you know our culture is all about our people right we we fully invest in our people but i also think that you know that our c suite individuals are relatable and that we're not it's nobody is it's almost like we feel like, like it's not like an organization where we're untouchable everyone's allowed to sort of approach and they they can feel comfortable to approach i feel like we're super transparent 
And I think that might be a little bit unorthodox, but maybe quite typical of a tech environment that we have a lot of flexibility. We pride ourselves in, you know, allowing our employees to have a hybrid type work environment where, and then for those that are not close to a local office, they can work completely remote. And I think individuals do love that flexibility. So that could be maybe a little bit unorthodox. As far as Maverick goes, that was actually just the recent team theme, excuse me, of our sales kickoff in Newport, Rhode Island. And it was pretty inspiring. I think that a majority of the mentality of our go-to-market folks is that they're extremely driven, they're disciplined, they're, you know, they're competitive, but in a good way. Uh, and and you know, ultimately, you know, we're working with partners and we're really. I feel as though we're on the right track to really blow this out of the park. You know, you know, we're we're trying to sort of come up with what can work best to make us stand out with our competitors, and I think we're get we're getting there quickly. Sales enablement is almost a relatively kind of new concept. I remember when I first started in the working world, you know, 12, 13 years ago, sales enablement really wasn't a thing. Whereas now sales enablement and customer success seems to be every company is adopting that as a methodology. Can you tell me a little bit about what sales enablement and customer success really is? I mean, sure, absolutely. I mean, sales enablement can is is a few things, right? I mean, it basically... It provides employees with efficient training and onboarding. It provides them with one centralized location for content management. It also improves the sales process. It optimizes the sales process. It allows our team members to collaborate, to communicate. And, and lastly, I mean, it really, it's that, knowledge, that content knowledge and knowledge to, again, like win more deals, improve productivity, and basically drive revenue goals. So I think it's it's extremely important important to the organization. As far as customer success goes, I mean we have an incredible group of customer success folks that work for Big Tin Can. They're extremely dedicated. They're always looking for ways to enhance our services or have our our services enhance our our customers experience and and grow the business you know with existing customers so that's definitely something that we pride ourselves in as well just that that support that empathy like how can we make things easier for you yeah Mental i mean is, is it yeah it is it is interesting like i do i do feel the world has changed a bit from me again when i first started in my uh job it was very much a kind of hunter mentality go out and win the business and there wasn't a whole lot of thought given to customer you know experience and making sure that you know you, you really you know you left your customers singing your praises and having a really fantastic experience with you so they would continue to, to come back and um, whereas i think over the last kind of um, you know maybe seven or eight years there's been a really yes. big spotlight on that and um you know i think uh, a lot of companies that have embraced that mentality are starting to really Really benefit from you know retention of customers and good referrals to other businesses and things exactly. like that. Exactly, and that's you just hit on a great point, Chris. Is that ultimately we get we do as an organization we do get a quite a bit of a ton of referrals, and mm -hmm. it, to your point as well is is retaining these customers and growing the existing business with these yeah. existing customers. And I guess we live in a world now where feedback is so easy to share. You know, I, I barely buy anything or go to a restaurant that I haven't read up on beforehand. So whereas 10, 15 years ago, I, I don't think that was really a thing. So I think that experience piece, given how many forums there are for companies to share their experience and say, look, yeah. this company were amazing. I really enjoyed working with them. Well, this company wasn't very good. I would not recommend working with them. It must be so important because, you know, there is just... Again, there's so much more of that now than there was years ago, I think. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I've seen a dramatic change because you're, you're completely correct. I mean, even if I look back, say, seven or eight years ago, when I did work it at a marketing e-commerce company where we did have account management, but it just it wasn't to the level to where it is now as, as time has progressed. And I think it will only get better, especially with the integration of AI. I think we'll only see more dramatic improvements. And we do, in our suite of products, we do have a beta test at the moment called Genie AI that we're hoped to, we hope to roll out in the very near future. So it's wow. it's really pretty incredible. 
Yeah, no, that's, that's exciting. You are coming up to your one year mark um, at Big Tin Can. Tell me when you first joined the organization, like what were your goals when you first oh. came in? And how did you, you know, I imagine it's almost hard sometimes to know where to start at an organization when you're trying to improve things at a high level like you are. How did you approach things in the first sort of few weeks? And how, how's that gone for you over your first year? Sure. Great question. I, I can tell you that when I first started with the organization, you know, there was, it was a lot of different things that I had to sort of, I had to encounter and learn and kind of dive right in. We are publicly held on the Australian Stock Exchange. So for me, I actually spent some time training with a consultant to learn you know, how to navigate being a publicly held company in Australia. I did not have any experience whatsoever. And the folks at Big Tin Can gave me the opportunity to give me a chance. They invested in me. They believed in me. And that's been extremely beneficial. You know, I'm also, I participate in um, remuneration planning, which I had, I had specifically for the executive leadership team, which I hadn't done in the past. So it's been an extremely cool experience learning and growing with that. But in terms of my initial, my initial objectives, when I first started, I think for me, my team had gone through a lot of changes prior to me starting. And I believe that their, one of their leaders was not in the U.S., and I think it, it became a bit of a challenge because a lot of our leadership team is based here in the U.S. So they did indeed bring me on board. And what I did was basically as I assessed my existing team. I have team members in the U.K. I have a team member in Sydney, Australia. And I do have two folks that are in Massachusetts in the U.S., so what I did was I basically initially kind of looked at my team and learned and started to try to dive in and learn the strengths and weaknesses of the folks on the team. And what I found was the cool thing about it is where, where some of our folks were extremely strong, others might fall a little bit short, but mm -hmm. all in all, I have an incredible group of people that work with me. And the way that I lead is I, one th comment that I feedback, a piece of feedback I got when I first had started, or maybe a few months in, is that my folks on my team felt heard and they felt like they were able to kind of run with some of the, their ideas without being roadblocked. So, I mean, I pride myself in that. One other thing, obviously, Chris, you, you and I both know that mistakes do happen and team members might make mistakes from, from here and there. And what I always do tell my team that I lead is that, guess what? It's We're all accountable. It's HR, it's people and culture. It's not just Joe Smith who might've made a minor error. We all take that accountability. I never, I, I'm not the type of leader that believes in throwing my people under the bus. If anything, we're accountable. And we say, how can we make it better uh, the next time? No, I love that. I think that's, that's fantastic. We interrupt this podcast for a quick 30-second introduction to Engtel, the host of Her Success. Engtel is a U.S.-based staffing agency specializing in engineering and technology. We have an insatiable passion for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and part of our mission is to balance the diversity scales in our industry. We are so tied to this mission that we donate $1,000 from every diverse placement made to our very own nonprofit, Diversify the Future. We then use that money to fund scholarships for underrepresented groups of people to help them obtain a STEM degree. If you're an engineer or a tech professional looking for a new position, or maybe you're hiring for talent in this space and want a recruitment partner, please get in touch. You, you mentioned, yeah, you have uh, team members across the, the world. And I think one of your, your previous uh, positions as well, you mentioned you had people in, I think, the UK, US, India, Israel. Yes. I help maintain level of camaraderie and and you know just a good working relationship when you guys are probably working different hours you're from very different cultures i feel right. sometimes i've kind of been out of this you know if a couple of people seem a bit down it's quite easy to be of course let's go grab lunch or let's go grab a coffee or you can always read right. people's body language a lot more easily and i always find it a bit more challenging how have you navigated that yeah, I actually, I love that, that part of, of my role and, you know, ultimately what we do is, and some of these things are pretty basic, right? But I think they're extremely important as we do, we, we do meet as a group once a week for over an hour in a time that works for all employees in each region. 
And aside from that, we also, I, and I will tell you, I, I am one of those folks where I understand we get busy and some things do happen, but I do not like missing one-on-ones with employees. And those happen on a weekly basis as well. I'm fortunate where my team is small, I can accommodate that. But I think our calls are extremely productive. It's not just, what did you do this week? I think we we talk more about, I don't feel like I have to micromanage my people because they produce results. So some of the conversation might be just like, understanding how, how are you feeling today? I have someone on my team that will be having a first time child. And I think I am relatable and I like to, you know, treat my people as humans as they are and make sure that they feel rewarded and recognized. That's a huge thing for me. I tend to do little things for my team members from here to there, just basically let them know that they're extremely appreciated by me. Just small gestures, but I think it's very, very important. And I often give feedback, positive feedback, not just to one that's outstanding, but to all for, you know, different periods of time. So it's, it does tend to work for me. I think I also, I love that we're able to, I ask questions. If uh, someone's not in the U S I want to learn more about their culture and I, I leverage my relationships with the folks in the UK and in Australia. I leverage those relationships and basically go to them and because they're subject matter experts for their country. And I think that's super helpful for me because it helps them feel empowered that I'm learning at the same time. Yeah, definitely. It is interesting. Like I think when you consider, you know, different teams across the world, um, you know, there might be a lot of people with different backgrounds and different genders and different ages, but I think there's a common thread between how everyone likes to be treated and, and how we should communicate with people, right? Everyone wants transparency. Everyone, um, you know, wants an open door policy. Everyone wants to feel good about their work. Everyone wants flexibility and autonomy. I think that sometimes people forget that and, that you know, the, the best way to treat our 22-year-old American here in America is probably very similar to treating someone very different on the complete other side of the world. There's almost a golden thread of things from a leadership perspective that you can do to make people feel part of the team and feel good regardless of, of where they're at in the world, I think. Absolutely. That's very, very true. It's true. And I think that it's it's really cool to see. I think I had a, re- a great experience last week at Sales Kickoff, just getting to know our reps, our go-to-market folks, and to your point, like all different stages of their career, some more senior like myself, but some very, very junior and just getting to know everyone. But to your point, it's, I feel as though everyone has that common need, right? No matter what their objective is to feel, to feel empowered, to feel welcome, to feel like they're in a safe environment. I mean, those are some of the priorities to your point that are universal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Mm. Well, one of the the things that I think about a lot in our organization is how we can maintain the culture when we grow. I think we have a very good culture here. We have super, super high retention. And I think everyone is, you know, very much on the bus, but we're 55, 60 people and we have ambitious goals to grow to two, three, 500 people. And how do we maintain that culture as we scale? I know you mentioned when you were at, I think it was Parallel Wireless, you saw the organization grow from 120 people to 1,000 people under a four-year period, you know, that that you were there. Did you see the culture change at all? And was there anything the company did to maintain a strong culture when they were going through such high level of growth? I definitely did see a change in culture. And I have to say, it it was interesting because we did have different locations. And ultimately, we we worked extremely hard to, to not have our organization work in silos. But I do, I think for the culture piece, we did in a sense where like in terms of like the culture in Nashua, New Hampshire, which was headquarters might be a bit different from the culture in Israel. And, and, but again, all working toward a common goal. So yes, I definitely saw some changes, but I feel as though we had budget to really engage folks. We had a ton of immigration visas that we sponsored. We Mm -hmm. we relocated folks from India to the U S. So that was really kind of cool to have a very diverse culture as far as scaling and growing, we, we, we would celebrate, you know, one of the, our big things that we would do is we, where we had a predominantly Indian culture, we celebrated a lot of holidays in the U.S. to make sure that the folks that were from India felt as though we were, we were acknowledging their background and 
and their history, which was, it went, it went over extremely well. That was one piece. But ultimately, I think that I, I saw that it's, it's very different. Like to your point, when you have a, a company that's 50 to 60 people, everybody knows everybody extremely well. And if you're, if you're fortunate enough, it can be a really exciting, cool environment, like sort of like a family environment and you enjoy going to work every day. So I definitely saw that that meta changed a bit, but not for the worse. I think it, it sort of just evolved over time and it was a pretty exciting experience. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a very good point that you've just got to be okay with that evolution, right? Is it going to be the same? No. Is that a bad thing? Not necessarily, right? You can have a phenomenal culture, for an organization that's 50 people and a phenomenal culture for an organization that's 5,000 people. They're probably different cultures, but you can could still be a very strong one. So I, I guess it's just it's just different. Well, leader, how do you ensure everyone in your organization has an equal and equitable voice and they, they feel that, you know, like, again, if, if they're struggling or they have ideas or anything like that, they feel confident enough to come to the table and, and, and talk about it? So, I mean, for something like that, I mean, that's a great question and extremely important to me. I think for myself and my team and for all the execs for that matter, we're all very, very active listeners. And I do think, you know, one of the things that keeps me here is that I do find that we are an empathetic organization. I think we genuinely show genuine care for our employees. We encourage all, we encourage all to participate. We do have multiple channels for communication. I find that a lot of people come directly to me. We have a people and culture general email where we have a ton of inquiries and people will come to us directly depending on their comfort level. The way we're structured is we have an executive leadership team and then a senior leadership team in which the execs are all part of the senior leadership team as well. And we meet every other week. And in those meetings as well, like we, we ensure that obviously the ELT is at the forefront, but then we really empower the SLT to have a voice, to be involved, and make sure that we're cascading communication down to other managers and then to individual contributors. So that's extremely important. I think that one thing we pride ourselves in is promoting that psychological safety. I think mm -hmm. right now we're in, as you, as everyone knows, we're in these uncertain economic times. And since I started at Big Ten Cam, we have seen some unfortunately, some restructuring and some cost-saving changes. But what I will tell you is through the entire process, we're extremely transparent with employees. I feel as though we're generous with outplacement and with you know what we set our employees up with when, it, when we are forced to make a change. So I feel like we're very, very good about that. But we also give our employees, we have an EAP program where our employees, where they can have access to resources if they need them. And I do feel like I think that most people are extremely open to and, and communication is key. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, um, you know, the executive leadership team, senior leadership team is is an interesting one. I've learned so much about my own organization and um, for people that don't directly report to me. And we used to do this at my old organization. We called it reverse mentoring, which I know I think is a, is a universal thing. But having someone... Yeah you know, early career mentor, a senior yes. executive. And I found that so useful, you know, because you just, you see your business through the different eyes and you pick up on things that you just not wouldn't for a moment have thought. And because a lot of the time when you interact with your direct reports, certainly with mine, I've worked with them for a long, long time. We know each other really, really well. And it's part of the reason we work well together. But at the same time, we don't, probably come up with a million new ideas for each other because we worked with each other for such a long period of time. But when sure. I started speaking to people that I maybe didn't interact with that regularly, I ended up learning so much more about my own company and about our customers and about our culture. It really enabled us to, to get stronger. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's very true. Final, final question, you're actually running out of time here, which is crazy. I, I thought this has gone super quickly. I, I've ended with this in the last couple of podcasts, but if you were to give advice to someone, maybe in a similar background to, to yourself, uh, when you sure. first graduated, looking to just start their career, but motivated to move up the ladder and, and accomplish great things, um, what advice do you think um, you would give them? Absolutely. I think for me, my number one would be to new grads would be to, and whether it be in engineering whether it be female, whether it be male, whether it be human resources, any industry, I think one of the key 
qualities, it would, would be to be confident. I think confidence is key. If I look back at my 21 year old self, and if I look at now my much older than 21 year old self, I, I feel as though it's in, very important to have that confidence, even if it's not quite there to just exude that confidence, but be humble at the same time. It's that desire to continuously learn and educate yourself. I, I encourage new grads to sign up for newsletters, to, to read, like a continuous education outside of, say, the normal traditional undergrad and, or MBA or what have you. I think relationship building and networking is huge. That's extremely important. I also think for a new grad, making certain, and this is something to be truthful, I wish I had done, and I, I'll, I'll give this advice to, to younger folks, is when you are in school, I think if you can, and you're fortunate enough, definitely try to get internships that are within your field to start mm -hmm. to gain that experience prior to graduation. I think a, another thing too is, especially when you're starting out in, in your career, mistakes are going to be made. I make mm -hmm. mistakes every day. I'm still learning every day. And you know I'm more senior in my career. And I think just always taking ownership and accountability is extremely mm -hmm. important. It shows that you acknowledge that mistakes have been made, but you'll troubleshoot and do what you can to make things better. Just, co just constantly trying to improve are, are things that I think are very, very important. And I'm not sure if I touched upon this, but I also think if you're a junior, whether you're a junior engineer or a junior HR individual, I think getting into an organization and you know, if they don't, if a HR team or company doesn't have a mentorship program in place that you mentioned earlier, if they don't have a formal program, asking a more senior level employee if you can, if they can mentor you. I think that's extremely important. We've lost sight of that a bit, Chris, I think with not having as much in-person work. I do feel for a lot of these younger folks that will start a job remotely, any mentoring has to be over video. It's effective, but I don't think it's quite as effective as working in person. So, I mean, mm -hmm. those are some of the challenges that these new folks face entering the workforce. And it only makes myself and I think other leaders have that desire to work harder to make sure that they feel inclusive. So that's yeah. those are some of the things I would recommend. Yeah, no, I, I love it. I mean, I think the... The accountability for mistakes and the confidence almost go hand in hand. I think that, you know, when when I became a bit more confident in my career, I became more confident to say I messed that up. Well, that was completely on me. Agreed. I should have better there. I'm going to kind of next time I'll do this. Whereas prior, I was a bit more like, oh, let's not take the blame or like anything like that. I just sort of brush it under the carpet a bit. And yet your second point, 100%, I think, as leaders... Particularly when you have a remote culture, you have to understand that people are not going to be able to learn from osmosis as much as we did. You know, I learned right. so much from sitting around. I think we had 100 people maybe on the floor of my first organization in an open pan office. So, you know, yes. just sitting with those people every day, I learned so much. And it's not to say that people cannot learn like that, but you have to make more allowances and you have to make sure that the forums do exist for them to be able to learn like that, because it may not naturally happen if they're not, you know, sat in an office with, with a bunch of other people. Absolutely. That's a valid, great point. And it's exactly what we chat about all the time, but it is that challenge. Just getting people to return to office is just it's challenging. And um, I think it will be it will be an evolving discussion for us. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, that, that's all we have time for today. But Jen, thank you so much. And I think we touched on some fantastic topics here. I'm sure our leaders will um, really, really enjoy listening to this episode. And uh, yeah, I, I really, really appreciate your time. I appreciate you as well, Chris. This, this was great. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's Her Success podcast brought to you by Ectal. We hope you found this episode instructive, educational, and inspiring. Don't forget to tune in next week.